After his tentative enthronement in 336 BC, a 20-year-old Alexander the Great ruthlessly consolidated power in Macedon and securing the allegiance of prominent nobles. That done, the up-and-coming Argiad monarch spearheaded daring expeditions in the north, south and west before finally obliterating Thebes as an example in late 335. With Macedon's borders secure and his royal authority unquestioned, the stage was set for Alexander, tutored by Aristotle in the Homeric epics, to finally turn his glory-hungry gaze eastward. He would use the lethal army inherited from Philip II to invade Persia, a massive three-century-old dominion, almost 50 times larger than his own. Welcome to the second video in our series on Alexander the Great and his first clash with Darius's armies at the river Granicus. Alexander was always hunting for the decisive battle, but our viewers don't need to hunt for a perfect game to play on their mobile phone as the sponsor of today's video, Hunting Clash, is here. Hunting Clash knows everything about hunting and is eager to help you enjoy it from the comfort of your home. This next generation hunting simulator and shooting game is available for free on Android and iPhone, and you can support us by downloading Hunting Clash from the link in the description. Hunting Clash allows you to travel to breathtaking locations like the woods of Montana, the forests of Kamchatka, and go on an African safari for stunning views and realistic animals, to feel the thrill of big game hunting. Track animals like bears, wolves, elk and much more to hunt in a safe and humane fashion. You can select a bow or sniper rifle and play either solo or against real humans in 1v1 PvP duels. Become a master of sniper games, get epic loot and show off who's boss in this animal gun game. The graphics are like AAA sniper games, and the best part? You can get yourself a dog who can be trained to help you on your hunts. Support us and start having fun by clicking the link in the description and downloading Hunting Clash today. After leaving behind him the smouldering pile of rubble that was now Thebes, Alexander the Great returned to Pella and gathered all the Macedonian magnates. Together they began planning the invasion of Persia. During this meeting, the king's advisers counselled him to take a wife and sire an heir before departing. However, either due to political calculations or because his interest in women was tepid at best anyway, Alexander refused this suggestion. Royal finances were also in a precarious state following a year of non-stop military campaigning, and so the king was forced to turn to his companions and nobles for assistance. The propagandized account goes that Alexander doled out sections of the Macedonian crownlands until the finances of each companion were provided for. One of them, Perdiccas, is said to have asked the king, but what have you left for yourself? Alexander replied, my hopes. What the king was doing here, though, as Peter Green bluntly points out, was borrowing money. With the assembly thus concluded and all matters prepared, Alexander, his companions and the invasion army advanced through Macedonia and Thrace via the route used by Xerxes I in 480 BC, leaving Antipater as regent at home. 20 days and over 300 miles later, the Macedonians arrived in the Chersonese and prepared to cross the Hellespont. However, while Parmenion did the donkey work and used 160 Hellenic League triremes to conduct a complex but unopposed crossing from Sestos to Abydos, Alexander went south and crossed at Eleus with a small force. According to one account, just as the king's ship was about to make landfall in Asia, Alexander, clad in full armour, launched a spear into the sand and thereby claimed the eastern continent as Spear One land. Making sacrifices to the gods and conducting religious ceremonies the whole way, the king made a sojourn to the mythical city of Troy. Alexander then went north with his entourage, which included his closest companion, Hephaestion, and united with the main muster under Parmenian supervision on a plain near the town of Orispe. As his invasion of the Achaemenid Empire begins, it's worth going over what kind of army Alexander had at his command in 334 BC. It was undeniably the most tactically and technologically advanced military force of the age. However, unlike such greats as Chinggis Khan and his enemy's predecessor Cyrus the Great, Alexander hadn't made his own army, 
but inherited one developed by his father, Philip II. Waiting for their enterprising king on that broad plain near Arisbe were 12,000 of the best Macedonian heavy infantry, 9,000 Sarissa-bearing phalangites, and a further 3,000 elite hypaspists, otherwise known as shield-bearers or guards in the sources. Whether these crack troops were armed as pezhetairoi or as standard Greek-style hoplites is heavily debated, but it's possible that they changed to fit the situation. This prestigious unit was led by Parmenian's son, Nicanor. Secondary to Alexander's frontline heavy infantry were 7,000 allied hoplites drawn from cities of the Hellenic League and 5,000 hired mercenaries armed in a similar manner, which was still good for the era. To supplement these battle line units were 7,000 Thracian levies from tribes such as the Odrysians, Tribalians, and others. Most vaunted of all were the 1,000 archers and Agrianians, expert skirmishers, who were described as the Gurkhas of the ancient world. If one was to also count the 11,000 infantry of Parmenian's advance force holding the Macedonian bridgehead in Asia Minor, Alexander would have had 43,000 infantry at his disposal. However, in the wake of minor defeats against Persian generals before the main army arrived, it's uncertain but possible that most of this smaller army was withdrawn to Europe. Therefore, we will assume that most of Parmenian's 11,000 were either already integrated as part of the invasion army or remained behind with Antipater, leaving Alexander's infantry total around 32,000. Comprising the Argiad monarch's mounted strength was first and foremost 1,800 Hetairoi, the highly skilled companion cavalry at whose head Alexander would so often charge into the fray. They were commanded by Parmenian's other son, Philotas. There were also 1,800 of the equally skilled Thessalian cavalry, whose reputation for horsemanship almost matched that of the Macedonians, as well as 900 mounted scouts from Thrace and Paeonia, with 600 horsemen from the Greek cities. Overall, disregarding the 1,000 possible bridgehead cavalry, this brings Alexander's total cavalry to 5,100. Accounting for the possibility of some forces already in Asia, it seems fitting to bring the invasion force's total number of troops up to a nice round 40,000. Accompanying the soldiery were auxiliary elements, such as siege engineers, sappers, surveyors, administrators under a certain bookish Cardian bureaucrat called Eumenes, and scholars who would study and document the exotic wonders of the near-legendary East. Aristotle's nephew and Alexander's boyhood friend Callisthenes also served as the king's official historian. Alexander marshalled the army to readiness the following day. Then, almost certainly motivated by a mixture of scouting reports and supply concerns, began a march eastwards towards the satrapal capital of Hellespontine Phrygia, Daskilium. Rather than taking the entire army, the king left behind his 12,000 league and mercenary hoplites, perhaps suspecting their loyalty if put up against other Greek mercenaries. Making good time with his core Macedonian infantry and full 5,000 to 5,500 strength in horsemen, Alexander warned his men that looting and burning en route would not be permitted, as this was Greek land under occupation. More deviously, the properties of a dangerous Greek mercenary general in Persian employ, Memnon of Rhodes, were to be especially respected in order to make the Achaemenids distrust him. The Achaemenid Empire was a colossal entity of prodigious wealth, its dominions so vast that the great king, a recently crowned Darius III, did not feel it necessary to deal with such a petty frontier disturbance personally. Instead, several satraps from the western provinces, including Assamis, Spithridates, Assetes, and several others, mustered their forces and met at Zaleia in May 334, together with Memnon of Rhodes, to take counsel on the incursion. Fully realizing just how lethal Alexander's meat-grinding infantry would be in the field, and aware that the invaders were short on supplies and money, Memnon gravely counseled the Persian satraps not to engage in a pitched battle. Instead, they ought to enact a scorched earth policy, 
burning crops, fodder, provisions, wells, and even burn villages down if necessary. By doing so, and opening a second front in Greece using the Persian navy, Alexander would have to scurry back to Europe with his tail between his legs. This objectively shrewd advice meant possibly unnecessary sacrifice on the part of Darius's western satraps, and they balked at the prospect. Unwilling to torch their own lands, and subtly accusing the Greek sellsword Memnon of lapsing in his loyalty, the Persian governors universally rejected the scorched earth plan, and chose to fight it out. It's also possible that the satraps were all too aware that the great king had a reputation for scorning shirkers among his subordinate rulers, and weren't about to suffer his ire for no good reason. A number of other factors may have contributed to this choice, such as the Persian code of honour and internal politics. Satraps such as Asites were used to getting their own way, but Memnon, a Greek, owed his high position to Darius himself rather than them. Asites in particular had a reason to distrust Memnon, as the latter held royally appointed estates in his own satrapy. Whatever the reason, the Achaemenids mustered their forces and marched west to a position on the river Granicus, set on facing Alexander. Following his departure from Arispe, Alexander took his smaller, mobile army up the Hellespontine coast via Pacote and Lampascus before advancing eastwards. Arriving on the vast plain of which the Granicus was the standout feature, the Macedonian army was arrayed in a standard preparatory formation with two lines of phalangites in the centre and the baggage train behind. Cavalry and light infantry screened the flanks and served as reconnaissance troops in front. In the late afternoon, just before the Granicus, Alexander's scouts rode back and informed the impetuous king that a Persian army had finally been sighted on the far side. This news prompted Alexander to redeploy his forces in battle formation, a task he was swiftly able to accomplish due to the battle-ready marching order. However, when the Macedonian army got to the river, its generals quickly began having reservations about the prospect of immediate battle. Lined up atop the steep far bank were just over 10,000 Persian satrapal cavalry from across the empire, roughly twice Alexander's total. Arsamese and Memnon of Rhodes led Cilician and Greek mercenary cavalry on the Achaemenid's left, flanked to the left by Arsites and his Paphlagonian horse. Hyrcanians under Spithridates assorted mounted troops in the centre and Bactrian cavalry to their flank. On the extreme right was Reomithres, leading a contingent of mounted Median troops. As the Persians had ever since their empire's defeat in the 5th century Greco-Persian wars, roughly 5,000 to 6,000 Greek mercenary hoplites had been raised to serve as the satrapal army's heavy infantry force. However, possibly because they had the same suspicion of loyalty as Alexander had with his Greeks, the satraps positioned this hired unit a mile or two behind the river, under the command of a Persian known as Omaris, too far away to take part in the main battle. The rock-hard centre of Alexander's line were six 1,500-strong brigades of the phalanx, led by Meliega, Philip, Amintas, Craterus, Conus, and Perdiccas. To the right of the phalanx were Nicanor's 3,000 hypaspists, and then Philotus and Alexander himself at the forefront of 1,800 companion cavalry, several hundred mounted skirmishers, Agrianians, and some archers. 2,700 Thessalian, Thracian, and League cavalry were on the left under Parmenion. Following the army's deployment, Parmenion rode over to Alexander's position and counseled the king to delay any battle until the following morning. A hasty and most probably failed attack over such an obstacle as the Granicus now, he reasoned, would be a fatal blow to the entire expedition. However, if they waited until morning, the Persians, observing Macedonian superiority in infantry, might withdraw from their position during the night and allow an unopposed crossing. Our sources disagree on what the response was. However, most tell us that because of his Homeric desire to achieve heroic status through great deeds, or not wanting to buoy Persian morale by hesitating, Alexander disregarded Parmenian's cautionary advice and prepared the army for an immediate attack. 
clad in magnificent armor on the right wing, he was easy for the enemy to see, and so a number of elite contingents under the satraps shifted to oppose Alexander's elite Hatairoi hammer, hoping to kill him and end the incursion. The battle of the river Granicus finally began when the Macedonian king sent a mixed vanguard of prodromoi mounted skirmishers, Paeonian light cavalry, and a small unit of companions and his Agrianian favorites into the river, with the outward aim of securing the far bank. However, facing some of the best Achaemenid cavalry from the treacherous and slippery riverbed, they met predictably stiff resistance. Throwing spears and other pinpoint accurate missile weapons rained down on the beleaguered advance force, causing terrible casualties from a distance. Some of these satrapal units descended to meet the Macedonian vanguard in melee combat in the riverbed itself, removing them from the advantageous higher bank. This attack gradually drew in even more regiments from the otherwise unengaged Persian line, disrupting the orderly formation on Aristides' left and shaping the battlefield to Alexander's requirements. With the enemy drawn out and exposed by the sacrifice of his vanguard, Alexander charged wholesale at the head of just under 2,000 companion cavalry, arrayed as it was in a wedge formation. Galloping into the river obliquely to the right of the advance force, and thereby meeting little resistance, the Hetairoi and their king were able to swing left and crash straight into the exposed Persian left wing in the riverbed, where most of the enemy leaders were fighting. This struggle against the best Achaemenid cavalry was, as Arian relates, a cavalry battle with, as it were, infantry tactics, horse against horse, man against man, locked together. The Macedonians did their utmost to thrust the enemy once and for all back from the riverbank and force him into open ground, while the Persians fought to prevent their landings and hurl their opponents back into the water. The companions' discipline, skill and armament rapidly began to turn the tide. In particular, the Macedonians' efficient use of the cornel wood cistern lance compared to the lighter spear of the Persian cavalry. However, despite this gradual forcing of the Granicus on the Persian left, Alexander, in the thick of the fighting, became the target of a concerted effort by the Persian leadership to kill him as the spear tip of his forces pushed their way onto the far bank. Accounts differ as to the nature of this clash, but Arian informs us that at some point after Alexander's retinue penetrated the line, his spear snapped and he was forced to get a new one from a bodyguard. Isolated on the far bank with just a few companions, the king was quickly beset by several contingents of enemy cavalry. The leader of one, Darius III's son-in-law, Mithridates, was slain when Alexander wheeled around and drove his newly gotten spear into the Persian's face. It was only a moment later that another Persian aristocrat, Rosakis, confronted Alexander and lopped off a part of his helmet before himself being felled by the king's lance. While locked in mortal combat with Rosakis, the latter's brother, Spithridates, satrap of Lydia, bore down on Alexander from behind and prepared to deliver the coup de grace. The Persian sword was about to fall and end the 22-year-old king's life. However, at the last possible moment, an officer known as Cletus the Black swept in and severed Spithridates' arm at the shoulder, saving Alexander the Great's life. By that point, Having inflicted fearsome casualties and cut down many Persian commanders, the companions were getting the better of the Persian cavalry all across the right wing. Furthermore, the Agrianian skirmishers managed to breach the Persian formation's integrity and get in among the beleaguered enemy horsemen. As this hinge point on Alexander's right was being hotly contested, Parmenian's wing was charged by Reumithres' Bactrians and Medes, but managed to resist the assault. In the center, six Taxius of Phalangites and Hypaspists advanced inexorably across the Granicus, ineffectually showered by the Persians' missiles. When it became clear that the companions had punched straight through the Achaemenid left, the satrapal army broke in a wave of panic reverberating from Alexander's point of impact on the right all the way to Parmenion on the left, who had managed to hold the Persian cavalry there. A number of gallant Achaemenid units fought to the death in the river, while an equally great quantity included among them Memnon of Rhodes, 
used their mounted mobility to escape the field and ride to Miletus. They were able to do so easily, because Alexander, Parmenian, and the Phalanx, which was now on the far bank as well, didn't give chase to them. Instead, the Macedonian cavalry wrapped around the unengaged and now woefully outnumbered Greek mercenaries on either side, encircling them while the Phalanx lowered their Sarissae for another fight. We're left with no concrete reason as to why the satraps' hired infantry didn't march forward and join the main battle. It's entirely possible that Alexander's lightning assault and victory, which according to Professor Michael Thompson, was accomplished in less than an hour, took the Greeks by surprise and left them with no ample opportunity to react in time. Unfortunately, we can never know for sure. But what happened next is universally recounted. As if all of a sudden realizing their dire situation, and probably believing that a fellow Greek king wouldn't be too draconian, the mercenaries petitioned Alexander for mercy. Rather than granting it though, the Macedonian monarch assailed the Greeks en masse, butchering thousands of them in a hard-fought last stand. Plutarch claims that the king had been influenced more by anger than by reason. But one of those reasons might have been to make the brutal point. If you're a Greek mercenary, do not fight for Persian gold, or you will receive no mercy. Despite crushing the hired hoplites, Alexander's army took more casualties in this phase of the fighting than it had in the process of forcing across the river. In the future, the king would never again be so reckless and uncompromising in dealing with similar surrendered units, indicating just how much of a toll they inflicted. Whatever the case, about 3,000 were killed, and another 2,000 sent back to Macedonia in chains, where slave labour in the mines awaited them. Between 1,000 and 2,500 of the 10,000 Persian cavalry had also fallen in the battle, together with almost a dozen named higher officers and governors. On the victorious Macedonian side, casualty totals were far lower. Taking into account the possibility of propaganda to glorify the victors, our sources state that 100 to 120 cavalry were lost, and only 30 phalangites. However disputable these figures are, the strategic result was not. All of Asia Minor now lay open for the taking. After visiting the wounded and giving an honourable burial both to his own men and the fallen enemy warriors, Alexander appointed his own replacement satrap for Hellespontine Phrygia, instructed him to maintain the general status quo, and then moved south. Zeleia was taken and pardoned, while Parmenian was sent with a flying column to take over nearby Daskilium, which had been abandoned by its Persian garrison. Then, about eight miles short of Sardis, the garrison commander and many other leading figures came to meet the Macedonians in order to surrender the fortress, treasury and the city in its entirety to Alexander. From initial insecurity and near collapse after Philip's death in 336, Alexander had managed, in just two years, to crush an Achaemenid army in open battle and occupy one of the greatest capitals of the ancient Near East. But that was just the first step. Far to the east, in the heart of his massive empire, Darius III began raising an equally massive royal force to confront the invading Macedonian king himself. As Alexander considered his first victory from a newly dedicated shrine of Zeus at the Sardis Acropolis, Looking out onto the great continent beyond, he had to have known that the real challenge was about to begin. Once again, thanks to Hunting Clash for sponsoring this video. Download this awesome hunting game via the link in the description. More videos in this series are on the way, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see them. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.